It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. It's not a lie if you believe it. Laugh. We had a little fun because it's a very long day, you know. And learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. All right, let's go already. And John Nash. Pucker up, buttercup. With a focus on career, the consumer culture, and marketing from an LGBT point of view. We're all business, except when we're not. Hey, good afternoon, or morning if you're listening as you time shift, which we find out most of you do. I'm Tim Bennett, here as always with my good friend and co-host, John Nash. Hi, John. We're, we are the focus group. We're all business, except when we're not. John and I were talking business right before we got on here, after we had our, our little eggy breakfast over at the... Change uh, restaurants. The change restaurants. I think we'll go back to the other one. The, you um, didn't like the omelet at... Uh, no. no. Oh, okay. All right. Like well, we, hey, look, we, what we did normally we meet at a place called the TikTok Diner on the corner of 34th and 8th Avenue. In honor of Tim Gunn and Diane von Furstenberg. And that was, was for there. a long time we did TikTok. And then one day I just, I just said to Tim, I can't do TikTok. Well, the chicken went downhill. And the salad. Oof, yeah. Salads, I think they made the day before and kept in the refrigerator. And <laughs> depending upon how many they sold, you could taste it. But uh, so, hey, thanks again for joining us. If you want to follow along, we do have new shows every week. It's uh, the best way to find any up-to-date information is through Facebook, or as some people say, the Book of Face or the, on the machine. The book of Face, yeah, La Machine. And it's Focus Group Radio. We have two websites, or we have two pages for some reason. There, we have two different audiences because neither one will migrate to the other. I think Paul and Mass might be the only one that's on both. Yeah. But uh, you want to go to the one with the yellow icon that says Focus Group Radio. That's updated at least daily with uh, information about John and myself and what's coming on with the show, who our guests are. We also post uh, promos there during the week. That's the place to find out a lot about us um, kind of as an up-to-date current event thing. Or you can go to focusgroupradio.com to load any of the or download any of the platforms around, whether it's audio or video. That will give you all the links to all the various places you can find us pretty much. If it's a free free place, you'll find us, mm -hmm. right? Is that yep, the best way to say correct, it? That's correct, correct. John gets mad at me. I'll say it. One of my favorite days. It's the random sample. <laughs> well, John likes a guest. I don't. <laughs> That's why it works, right? I don't mind. I don't. I don't. Uh, I love I don't guest shows. I guess, but, but I, I just think sometimes when we don't have a guest, you and I can do our own flow, yeah, and it doesn't like last feel week. as rushed. Yeah, it was a very great show. Flew yeah. along, and it was no guests last week. So, and I forgot to buy. So we've got in the booth. We've got our friends Garrett and John and Allie. They're our producers. And that's our new show. It's going to be called Garrett, John, Ampersand, Ampersand and Allie. And Allie. And I forgot to. I was at the giant grocery store, and I saw the birthday cake. Oh, Oreos. thank you, Golden, for reminding me. And I wanted to get them for Garrett, Garrett. because he said that that is an A plus. We we tried hot yeah. and spicy cinnamon last week. Flavors that are not arriving till twenty eighteen. Which were great. The peeps we were kind of on the fence with. So the birthday cake Oreos vanilla cookie, mm -hmm. uh, the golden cookie. I'm in the store last week. It was the day after we did the show, and I'm standing in front of the Oreo aisle, and I, there they are. Did I'm you like, spot them? I bought them get them home. I opened the package and I was like, you know, should I save these and bring them in? Should I eat them? I thought I'm going to eat it. The minute I had one, I was like, oh my God, this is totally why Garrett loves these things. It's kind of... You did of not eat that whole bag. Gone. Bob and I consumed that bag. And we both, every time we ate one, we're like, it's just like having, it's just like putting your finger in a Duncan Hines frosting. I mean, it, it's birthday cake. Did you use milk or... You don't, those don't need dry. anything. Those don't need anything. I they bet are. Garrett does milk. Of course. He was like a milk boy. <laughs> you bite half, and then you take a sip of milk and ch combine it in your mouth. And all the sugar. Yeah. It, I tell you, I was bouncing off the walls after two cookies. Now, I mean, don't they do double stuffed birthday cake, too, or no? I I, they might, but I didn't see them at this. So you store. bought the golden cookie. I bought the A+. Plus, the right, one I've got to try them. I was never a fan of birthday plus. cake. You know, I have an aversion to birthday cake because as a child, I hated when the mother put ice cream. When I would go to birthday parties and the mothers would Jimmy, put why are you crying? paper plate and they would put a scoop of ice cream on the cake and made the cake soggy, I wouldn't eat it. It gets all, yeah. Even to this day, I don't like my cake and my ice cream mm -hmm. touching. 
So I, uh, that's my. So I have a even thing for to this cake. day. I won't. I, I sense a therapy session coming on. Do you like? There's probably certain things you don't like when your food touches it. Something else. Do you? Will you mix your vegetables on your plate as a kid? Yeah, yeah, we did that. So, you like know, corn with the potatoes or yeah, something. That's okay. It all goes the same place. You know, it's the, the, the dis as my mom used to say. The distinction between the zones on your plate is lost on your stomach. You know, by the time it goes down, there's no separating one. Oh, this from apple the other. doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> I'm Carol's son, right? You and your mother separated at birth. But uh, yeah, separated how many totally years? at birth. So we have a uh, we have a call already. So hey, if you want to give us a call, it's eight seven seven nine six two six eight four six. Call us anytime. We've got Rick in El Paso. Hey, hi hey, Rick. Guys. Hey, how are you, my friend? What's up today? Oh well, I'm I'm calling in for a suggestion. I'm an old man. I'm 60 years old, and my that's that's not is, old. That is not old. Okay. Well, my attention span <laughs> doesn't always always up with things, and I'll be working around the house and and sometimes uh, time shifting you and listening, and you all will be talking about something from Deep Discount, and you'll name a movie or you'll name a book and immediately go into describing it, but never name the book or the movie again. Oh. And I will often miss the, what it was and we'll have to keep rewinding to type, find, keep finding it. And all you'd need to do is rename the book or movie at the end of the description to remind us what it was you were talking about. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. So when we wrap up, uh, Rick, that's that's smart. So at the end of the segment, we can say, here's what we talked about. We talked right. about a book about Betty Davis, Tim's favorite movie for the holidays, Home, Home for, for the, the holidays. holidays. You know, John said exactly. this. That's a good All idea. All right, I, I, I'm down with that because I forget what I recommend sometimes, and I, I often want to order the stuff, too. Like last week, it was The Crown. Love The yeah. Crown. That's a great show yeah. on Blu-ray. You know, it's funny, Rick. We've thought about it, and we do it once in a while. We'll post it on our Facebook page, and maybe we should do a better job of that as well, of saying here's what our picks were this week, and then people can go there and find it as well. So I think that's a smart uh, recommendation. We'll do, we'll do it today. Yeah. We'll hotwire it in today. Yeah. And when we wrap up the segment for Deep Discount, we'll make sure we recap. It's a recap. What you have a pair of our socks, Rick? Uh, I've got two pair, but one's kind of raggedy. <laughs> you have the, do you have the purple ones yet? No, I have black ones. Oh, the gosh, those are old. Yeah, you need well, a pair send, of purple ones. Send us a, John, where are they send uh, send, a, send me your mailing address, Rick, to letters at focusgroupradio.com, and uh, Tim will send you a pair of purple socks, the newest, oh, the newest flavor great. of socks. Great, I'd love to have a pair. Yes, that'd be good. Based on your good suggestion, anyone else have good suggestions, of course. Get socks, we'll, yeah. We'll get socks. So, so thanks for calling. Okay, thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. That was a good point. Because, you know, I, I remember watching when Frank uh, DeCaro, back in the old days, would have on uh, his movie guy, Dennis yep. Dermody. And they would do that as well because I would hear something, they'd get into it, and they'd really enjoy it. And at the end, he would say, you know, here's our, here's our picks this week. It's oh, a boy. smart idea. And you, you bring up Frank DeCaro as a perfect example. He, he used to do Outfest every year in La, the uh, LGBT Film Festival in La, L.A. And one year he talked about a movie I mean, he he loved this film. It was really it's gonna it's gonna be a big hit in the independent film thing. And I didn't write it down. I didn't you know. And I remember weeks later, I sent Frank a note saying, "Hey, you recommended this film." He knew exactly what I was talking about, but I could not remember the name of it. So smart smart suggestion. Yeah. So uh, how how was your uh, how was your oh you're heading out? I am heading out tomorrow morning to Burbank. You're going to do the Johnny Carson show? Yes, of the Johnny Carson show. Stay at the luxurious Holiday Inn with an outdoor pool. The only two-star the <laughs> the only only two two star Holiday Inn in Burbank. <laughs> yeah, I'm flying out to Burbank. So I fly out in the morning. Um, the graduation, I'm not, it's just this... They have a the school does a uh, this is for my animation uh, degree that I just got so they everybody that finished the program up until this month graduates in 2017. You gonna put a cap and gown on? No, no, no. There's none of that, and I think they just recognize. I think you just stand up and they say congratulations. Da, 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 da. Yeah. I, for, I, so then there's for that best pose, best look of surprise. <laughs> goes to John Nash. I I think it's gonna be. You know, I originally I, did, I wasn't going to go, and then my mom was, you know, you know my mom, she was in, you got to go, you spent two years, hundreds of hours on this, it's an important thing to do, and I said, well, mom, I don't know, it's, you know, it's, I graduated from college once, it's like, now you got to go. 
So a lot of the guys and, and women that I took uh, class with are going to be there. So I get to meet a lot of my classmates um, from the two years. And then I was selected to, uh, I put my name into a lottery for graduates only for uh, a tour that I really do want to do. And that's going to be DreamWorks Studios, Animation Studios. So I'll see DreamWorks on Thursday. And Friday morning, I'm getting a tour of the Disney Animation Studios. And then there's this uh, event attached to the, gra they attached the graduation uh, called CTN. We were talking about it at lunch, Creative Talent Network. So I have a, I have a whole, all my days are booked. Are you going to keep quiet on the tour? No. <laughs> I'm going to ask whatever questions I want because I'll tell you, I learned from school. I should call them. No because... one asks questions. Well, John, but you ask too many. And... <laughs> You ask a lot of the obvious ones, and I, we've told this story on the show a million times. Is that the Bacardi plant? <laughs> Are those the people who make Bacardi? And that went for 40 minutes. In or baking, minutes in baking, baking, sun. Barcelona and Everybody sun. yelled at me. I'm the one who got yelled at. Uh, I'm, Tell him to not ask questions anymore was, in these tours. I bet that was... Uh, was Marin. Marin from Curve Magazine. Mm, she was Joey. So, Joey Pedro. Because all standing in the sun. There's no shade, not an inch of shade anywhere. Anyway. Kirk. I mean, it was... Everybody. So I'll be out in L.A. Um, each day is literally packed until like 11 or 11 at night. Then I come back on Sunday. Um, and it, these are events like the trade show event or the Creative Talent Network. They're... You get to meet directors and illustrators and animators from the different studios, and so that could be kind of cool. A lot of those presentations are just presentations. You sit in the audience and you watch. Well, that's cool. So you get to go around and see all what's... Yeah, it's the DreamWorks and Disney ones. I'm most The actual looking at a working animation studio that I'm most fascinated by, I think it's going to be kind of cool. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> Look, Tim's looking down at the paper. Yeah, that's going to be great. Okay, anyway, moving right along. No, I realized, I, so I was looking at the show run today, and I realized I made a mistake on it, for me anyway. Oh, okay. But It's not going to affect the, the boys in the booth, is it? It may very well. <laughs> no, 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 it's not, it's, it's not going to affect them, but it's going to affect, well, it might, it might affect them. It affect me. I think I did everything right, but I'm looking at this now. Well, I should have checked it earlier. This is how things work on the fly. What caught your eye? <laughs> what caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Okay, uh, we've talked a lot in the past, uh, and Tim and I are, have certainly dealt with this in our marketing and advertising careers, and that's the notion of a brand aligning with a celebrity, and then what happens when that celebrity does or says something that the consumer doesn't like, they take it out on the brand they're aligned with. And so there was an article uh, that came out, and it's about, uh, I, I hope I'm not going to, is it Mila Kunis? Ashton Kutcher. Okay, there's thumbs up in the Mila? booth. Mila Kunis. Like the vacuum? Yeah. Mila? No, no, that's Mila. Mila. The Mila vacuum. But Mila Kunis. Is it Mila like milk or something in French? What is it? I don't know. It's, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that one. But so it's uh, the headline is Jim Beam faces boycott over Mila Kunis's planned parenthood donations under Mike Pence's name. Uh, so numerous social media users are boycotting Jim Beam which Kunis is a pitch woman for, with the hashtag boycott beam after the actress revealed she leaves an anonymous donation to Planned Parenthood under the vice president's name each month. So she was on Conan O'Brien a while ago, right. and she said every month to his office he gets a little letter that says, an anonymous donation has been made in your name, Planned Parenthood. <laughs> So the tweets began shortly thereafter, and the uh, first one was, or they have a ton of them, but here's a couple. I will not buy Jim Bean until they get rid of Mila Kunis, uh, tweeted Jim O. Jones. There's a real account, right? I find abortion reprehensible, and whether you agree or not, it should not be taken lightly. She needs to go. Um, I own six liquor stores in Missouri. Missouri! And we've pulled your products off our shelves. You can no, that's Missouri. Missouri. <laughs> Missouri would keep it. Missouri took it off. <laughs> True. Um, and they also want to boycott her movie called Bad Mom's Christmas. Um, in addition to boy, you know, they want to boycott the movie as well. So uh, isn't this a situation where Planned Parenthood? They, they've labeled it abortion, right? But isn't there a lot more of, in terms of health? Uh, services at Planned yeah. Parenthood. Yeah, there's provides. women's health services. You know, there's mammograms. There, they, they, all the things it, that, in fact, there are no federal dollars right. that ever go to right. a, an abortion if Planned Parenthood gives one. And you know, 
so I'll, th uh, there's a whole other counter Twitter movement to support her, and someone said it may be time to start drinking Jim Beam, thanks to Mila, Mila Kumis, um, wrote a Twitter user. Th th this is not like, you know, that one, one Twitter person who said, you know, uh, abortion is reprehensible. I don't, I don't think you're going to find a lot of people who disagree with that. No one's pro-abortion. No one, it's an option a woman should have plain and simple in my opinion uh, because of circumstances and no I don't think they make the decision lightly no. that's the that's the whole thing this this treats it as if it's just some kind of like let's go buy a Twix bar and have an abort I mean it's not so um, this was one of those cases where uh, corporate America now had this they have to make a decision do we keep Mila Kunis on board or do they not care about sales impact from a Jim Beam boycott I would guess that 99 percent you and I yeah. Live through this with Subaru, yep. right? So we would get all these people that would send in protests and horrible letters. We're dying. We're going and to hell. Crayon. We're going to. We're <laughs> pedophile. We're all kinds of things because Subaru marketed to the LGBT consumer. At the end of the day, when we did a cross check with names, not one person ever bought a car. Right. They probably would never buy a car because the type of customer that bought a Subaru was usually well educated and and mm -hmm. pretty diverse. So I would guess the same thing with Jim Beam is that my guess is whoever decides they're going to boycott this, they're probably either not drinkers anyway, and this is just another one of these almost robocall sort of things where we're going to get the base all fired up and start sending in form letters. Because you know, that yeah. what was it, the AFA site? Oh, yeah. Would have, you know, here's who we're boycotting this week. The American Family Association American Family and their Association. chapters in different right. states would boycott, yeah. They'd be upset if there was a gay character on a TV show or if a brand advertised on Will and Grace or any of that nonsense. And when you look at, if somebody's watching Will and Grace, they're probably okay with the fact that there's gay people in the world. Yeah, if you're, if you're a watcher. Right. So here's the thing that I think, to your, to your argument, I would say this. The second biggest purchase a household makes is an automobile, usually. And um, the impact of a boycott on an auto brand is not going to be noticeable for quite a while, right? You, you'd have to actually look at dealer by dealer sales stats to figure out if there's a downgrade in traffic. Packaged goods and liquor, though, you know, we know from our work that we did with Absolute years ago that you can track case sales pretty carefully. So I would, I would suspect that Jim Beam, if they were smart and I don't doubt that they are their marketing people are probably talking to the reps in the field to see if there's distribution uh, changes or fluxes based on something like this and if if it doesn't look anything other than the normal up and down of an ordering cycle you could ignore it right yeah I would if I was if I was the CMO at Jim Beam or whatever I would ignore it because you're not going to you're never going to engage whenever you engage in that sort of fight or that sort of debate you lose and when you acknowledge them, then that fires up the base even more. Oh, we got a hold of somebody now. Let's keep keep bombarding them, keep bombarding them. And if you're weak, which there were a number of people at Subaru that were at the time, they, if they you're weak, it. you would you, you, yeah. you take the bait. If you weren't, then you just understood that uh, it was just a letter writing campaign, and you know it didn't affect anything. And it was yeah. And as you said, it was after you left the brand, um, and we were working with them for a few years after you left Subaru. I can't tell you how many fires I put out. Could you do a, could, here's, here's the phone call. Can you do a white paper on the Florida uh, Family Association and their boycott of the, the, the logo TV station? I'm like, here we go again. You know, they're not buying your car. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But to the C-suite, it matters. If, 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 if someone gets a hold of the chairman's email or the uh, CFO or the CMO and they start banging away, now, now you just don't want that mail. And you start reading it, and you're like, well, and then they call Tim Bennett it's up. Having the, it's having the internal champion at any of these companies as yep. well that knows enough on what to do. So where a lot of these employee resource groups are probably important at a lot of these Fortune 500 companies now is when that stuff comes in, they could be useful to say, yep. how do we address this? Because you're exactly right. When the letters would come into Subaru, they got intercepted by Abana, immediately sent to me, and then I worked with a it, one person over in the customer dealer services area that answered everything, so it all came from one voice. And it sounded the same. And, right, and it all, so there was a, there was a way that it just tri triangulated within the company, and that's how you handle it. But otherwise, like you mm -hmm. said, you would do a fire drill. I would never bother you with that nonsense. I only heard about, quote, air quote, that nonsense when we came to present. Yeah. And and at, by that point, you'd already run interference with the yeah. C-suite. And they're like, hey, welcome back. You're doing a great job. Da, 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 da. Oh, no, I, I learned that years ago from one of my mentors, Tim Mahoney, who just said, you know, if, 
if you engage if you engage them in an argument, you're never going to win. No, no. And, and, so, and the minute you open the dialogue, yeah. then they're then they're in, and that's well, what's like what happened with, with Ford. Yeah, the boycott that they had because of their dealers. Right. And then as soon as Ford, then as soon as they got onto it and grasped on, it became Shut a disaster. It all down. Right. So that's uh, I just thought you'd enjoy that one only because we've, good ex one. we've experienced it, and uh, not with a liquor uh, product, but in general. Yeah, mine. It's a 180. If they find it, I don't know. Headline is, mother of five is knocked unconscious by an exploding washing machine. Did yeah, you see this? Is. There she is. So this woman is in Minnesota. She's got five kids. She was uh, she knocked off her feet and lost consciousness after her washing machine exploded while she was doing laundry. When you say exploded. Exploded. It was a three-year-old Whirlpool duet. You mean the door blew open? Well, you'll see there if, so if you're watching on wow, the... Wow, something looks wrong about it. Well, yeah, so she, uh, Sarah Van Beck is her name, from Freeport, Minnesota. She says she was in her home washing clothes and she heard a whistling noise, loud whistling noise, coming out of, out of the uh, laundry room there. She rushed over to investigate. Now, part of me finds this funny, <laughs> but I know it's horrible. She bent over to investigate. She saw the washing machine shaking and howling. It was near its end of its cycle, and then the door blew up and it knocked her down. Ball bearings came flying out. She was knocked unconscious. That's the damage. Yeah. If you happen to be watching on, or you're, if you're not watching on YouTube or Facebook, and thank you for tuning into the live broadcast if you are, the door of the washing machine has been, that's like a whole Blown gasket. Off. Like it looks like the entire inner drum is like being pushed out the door. It's wow. They said the ball bearings flew out of the machine, knocked her down. She hit her head on the floor. She was rendered unconscious. She said it sounded like a bomb went off. It was so surreal. So as I said, the door flung open. The force blew her off her feet. She fell backwards, hit her head. The force of the fall um, made her lose her phone. She started to try to reach her phone once she woke up from being knocked out. And she said, but the force of the blast hurled the phone into another room. As she was laying there with her head hurt, she said she remembered she had on her Apple Watch. So she asked Siri to call the fire department, which is where her husband worked. <laughs> Serious? Noah. Noah was the first responder, so he heard the address, knew it was his house, rushed over there, found his wife on the floor, took her to the emergency room. She was diagnosed with a concussion and a sinus cavity injury with ball bearings all over the floor. She, uh, she sinus cavity injury. Uh, yeah, boom. Wow. So she said that uh, she felt she should alert people. So she posted something on Facebook, had over 17,000 people generate thousands of thousands of responses and shares. She said everyone has laundry in common. Yep. So, you know, it was yep. a pretty popular thing. Whirlpool contacted her. They said they can't imagine what happened, but they're going to investigate. Meanwhile, they decided to get her a brand new washer and dryer. Okay. Meanwhile, they, that should have been the first thing, is we're going to replace that immediately and we'll investigate and get back to you. Yeah, she says, Whirlpool said, although we cannot speculate about what may have happened in this particular product, Whirlpool is committed to delivering innovative and safe products to the consumers. They're also going to pay for her medical expenses. She said it could have been a lot worse. It could have been her children that were in front of it, and then that would have been deadly. Wow. It's a device that I never think about causing harm, right? No, that's, and that's why I said part of me thinks it's funny, but part of me realizes it's maybe not funny because you don't think about that stuff. Now, I've thought of my oven blowing up. Realizes maybe not funny. You know, and after like the pilot light, I'm always afraid I'm going to blow the house up. You know, one of our pilot lights on one of the burners of our stove is a little, what do I want? It's, it's, it, it's uh, temperamental. That's the word. And I, the minute it doesn't do it, I turn it off. I, I blow like air because I don't want gas. <laughs> And then Bob will come in and just take a match and push, light it up. And I'm like, <laughs> and I, I, he just trusts. He goes, no, that, no, nothing to worry about. The gas is going up. You put the mat, you know, he has no fear of that stuff. But yeah. that would definitely bother me. Today was one of those days we had a tough time finding a business birthday. I think I found one. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings. But the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So happy 69th birthday, born today, November 15th, Da Tuck Jimmy Choo Yang Keat. He's a fashion designer based in the UK. He's best known for co-founding Jimmy Choo Limited, which is known for its handmade women's shoes. You know, the woman might have the Jimmy Choo's. Okay, so Jimmy Choo, I will always associate Jimmy Choo with HBO's Sex in the City. Oh, okay. Because Sarah Jessica Parker always had to have the newest pair of Jimmy Choo's or whatever. But to me, those two are, are linked. And that's all. The minute I saw his name, I'm like, oh, it's Choo's. Did Stephanie Choo teach a friend of yours English? To get her scores up for, <laughs> there for the SETs, his sister. He was born in Malaysia in a family of shoemakers. 
So it was in his blood. Are you a cobbler? Yeah. You can't make, you can't find. You can't buy those shoes. Here's the funny thing. His real, real last name was supposed to be Chow. The family's name is Chow. When he went to the hospital, they misspelled the name on the birth certificate as Chu. So it would have been C-H... So his name would have been Jimmy Chow. Okay. C -H -O -W. I think Chu is better, actually. Chu is good. Chu for shoes. His father taught him how to make shoes. He made his first pair when he was 11 years old. He went off to uh, what came to be known as the London College of Fashion. He graduated in 83. He worked part-time in a restaurant in a shoe factory cleaning. And uh, after graduation, he ended up starting designing shoes in 86. His craftsmanship caught the attention of some people there at the... Uh, the shoe place, and uh, he had a spread, featured spread, in 1988 in an issue of Vogue. And Princess Diana put him on the map. She she was a patroness. She she supported his uh, his shoe designs. I fashion, and I don't. When you saw the picture of those shoes, they don't look comfortable. No, none of those shoes. I don't are. think they're supposed to be. I think that's all about yeah. It's about look, clip clopping but... around. So he sold his. He, he in 2001 he sold 50 percent of his stake in the company for 25 million. And now he just does some design work and uh, makes lady things. So colognes, perfumes. Did you make up the lady things or was yeah. that in the art? Lady yeah. things. It said, it says his ready to wear line is expanded to include accessories such as hand bar, handbags and perfumes. And I said, lady things. <laughs> it's lady things. I, I literally see the lady handwritten thing. note, but I'm a lady. So happy <laughs> birthday to Jimmy Chow Chu. <laughs> You had to get that name in there, didn't you? So, hey, as Rick, as Rick uh, mentioned when he called us from El Paso, Deep Discount's been a sponsor of ours for most of the year, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, if you want to uh, check out all the things Deep Discount has, be sure to head over to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo, which is right there on the screen with the arr, John called the shark. Arr, shark, the, the pirate shark, shark. The pirate shark, there you the, go. The Deep Discount shark. And get and we get credit for it. Or if you just go to Deep Discount on your own, that's good too. But they won't know you're coming from us. So we'd like you to go there first. And uh, they're having a site-wide sale right now, and uh, which I love because as much as John's a fan of mu uh, movies, I'm a fan of music. Although I did pick uh, two things this week. One of them is music, and one of them is a TV show. And it's all around the holidays. It's all for, all for Christmas time as we're getting close to the holidays. If you order now, you'll be able to get the stuff and either keep it for yourself or has it as gifts. So last week you recommended Oro, which Oro. is Ava Gold, all the songs in Spanish. You also recommended Ella's... Gerald, have a swinging... Sweet. Wishes you a swinging Christmas. Which is like four... Oh, nine yeah, or something at deep discount. So, and you Buy a dozen, give them as gifts. Give them as gifts. So, this week, so as I was poking around, I love Christmas music that's obscure. Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So, I used to go to, I used to, go to iTunes, and that's all messed up now, so don't go there anymore. <laughs> but um, it is, it's a disaster. You and I talked about this. It's so all much. messed up now, so don't go there. No, anymore. I don't buy anything from there anymore because it's a disaster. The program itself, iTunes, is just yeah. <clears throat> bloated, but. So I, pick? so well, I poked around and I found this thing called Snow Globe. It's under nine dollars. It's a CD. You can also get an LP for under twenty-five dollars. But it's the fifteenth studio album of Erasure, and it's a collection of original compositions and seasonal classics such as Silent so Night, John Silver just Bells, threw that up. Snow, White Christmas. I've never heard of this. I never heard of it. It came out in two thousand thirteen. I'm sorry, it came out, yes, it came out in 2013, and then they, re, uh, they released an LP edition in 2016, if you still like to have vinyl. What's interesting about it, they interviewed the guys at Eraser, Eraser, Eraser. Eraser and uh, they said that unlike your typical holiday album, they purposely went with a stripped down and eerie feel. To, the, uh, to many of the music tracks. Vince Clark from the band said, everything about Christmas has already been written. So we thought we would be more interesting in looking into the darker side of the season because for a lot of people, Christmas is not a happy time. So they worked with, um, <laughs> they, <laughs> I knew you would like that. They yeah, worked with Steve Gareth quite well. <laughs> they worked with Gareth Jones from Depeche Mode to help produce the album and put it together. So it's, it's got a pretty cool vibe to it. I clicked on some samples. I'm definitely going to get it because oh, yeah, yeah. they have lots of these sort of 80s bands that have done Christmas. So they work with someone from cool. Depeche Mode. From Depeche Mode, they worked with it, it's um, the Smiths, Gareth Jones. It's the Smiths that did that song, Girlfriend in a Coma. Yeah. 
So I, 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 in a coma. Santa's in a coma. I know. <laughs> They did that. So they got two or three others, but they've got like bleak midwinter, bleak, bleak midwinter, blood on the snow. There'll be no tomorrow. I mean, it's kind of a dark album, but that's that's them. And then the other one, I think it's 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 a holiday classic. If you don't have this, you need to have it. You need to add it. It's 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 like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer or or Santa Claus is coming, coming to town. It's the Pee Wee Herman Playhouse. Oh, Christmas special. excellent choice. It's on DVD for under five dollars, or the Blu-ray is a little bit more. It Just is special, the wackiest the whole, Christmas yeah. special ever. It laughs for the whole family. Um, it's unique in that it also offers a, um, so it's a Christmas show, but then they automatically, they go to it, they change the set and it becomes Hanukkah. And and the, the Hanukkah portion of our show. Now it's yeah. time for the Jewish portion. And the dinosaurs of our had little dreidel, and, right. I and they play that. with the dinosaurs. And uh, Great it, suggestion. it's hilarious. And just if you don't know about this, you probably should hand in your your LGBT card. Um, <laughs> just to Jones. give you just to give you a, 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 a listing of some of the people who appear and appear and sing. So Paul Rubens, of course, is Pee Wee Herman. Grace Jones, Joan Rivers, Oprah Winfrey, Frankie Avalon, Charo. The Del Rubio triplets, also a great CD. Annette Funicello, Zsa Zsa Gabor, sure, yeah. Katie Lang, Little Richard, Dinah Shore, Whoopi Goldberg, Cher, Magic Johnson. <laughs> I mean, can, can it get campier? The minute you said Katie Lang, I could see her doing Jingle Bell. She was doing Jingle Bell Rock. She it sings. is the campiest thing ever it's made. It's great. I didn't know they sold it individually. I thought you had yeah. to buy the whole uh, uh, No, the whole you can set. buy the special. It's under, as I said, it's under five bucks for the DVD at deep discount. Hilarious. Brilliant. All right. So now, those are my two. So... I went in a slightly different direction because as you always do, as I always do, because I'm going out for my animation graduation. I decided to profile three titles that I grew up with as a kid, and then probably were most influential in me decide lo loving movies and animation and stuff like that. And the first one is a show that I know you watch as a kid. It's Johnny Quest. That was a good serial, wasn't it? Johnny, well, yeah. <laughs> Quisp. Well, that was Quisp. Serial. Yeah. So Johnny Quest came out in 1964. Hanna-Barbera was their first live-action TV animated show. It only lasted, I didn't realize this, 26 episodes. That's it. Was that it? One season. I thought it was multiple seasons. But when we, by the time we were watching this, it had already oh. been on the air for a little bit. So it featured Dr. Quest, uh, Johnny, his dog Bandit. His... Isn't this the one where you thought you looked like the blonde? Uh, did I think I looked like yeah. Don? Well, I, I probably did at that age. I yeah. think I remember you saying you thought you looked like Johnny Quest. <laughs> his uh, his friend Haji and, of course, Race Bannon was their, the, the Quest family bodyguard that would accompany them on all their, their exploits. Uh, that's available also on uh, DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, the other next thing I picked was something I'd never seen before, and I'm definitely picking it up because I suspect that this is what we grew up with as opposed to later. They remastered the Gumby show, but they remastered the Gumby show from the 1950s, the very original Gumby and Pokey. I thought it Pokey. was Gumby and Pokey, so it's just Gumby? It was called the Gumby show. The blockheads oh, are in there. I have seen that. They've gone and they've taken the original mask. They've been remastered from the original camera rolls and soundtracks. Apparently it looks great. But I suspect that this is what we saw, these 50s versions growing mm -hmm. up, because they did have a Gumby. and The Gumby and Pokey show was made in the 60s. Yep. So I wrote Gumby down. He looks like it could be an extra Priscilla Queen of the Desert. <laughs> big pants. Yeah. Didn't they do yeah. a whole look like that? Um, and our, some of our friends over at Deep Discount were talking to me last week about Gumby, and they know Art Cloak or Cloaky, one of the the guys that did the original animation. I think they know his family. I thought it was claymation, or is it's, it animation? You no, know, it's claymation, meaning it's stop motion. They bend it, they they sculpt That's it, a long they take day. a frame. It's a very long day. It's a very long day. Yeah. Not me. But I remember those shows. Like, and Bob, the minute he saw me pick this, he goes, "Oh, his favorite." Bob goes, "My favorites were the Blockheads, because the Blockheads were troublemakers. Yeah. Remember, they were just crazy." And the last one uh, that I picked is the Thunderbirds complete series on Blu-ray. They called this Super Marionation instead of marionettes and puppets. It was Super Marionation. Do you remember the Thunderbirds? Yeah. With the strings, and they're like, you know, okay, Thunderbird Five. <laughs> I rewatched a couple of these. Did and it hold up? 
I'll say this: um, they're worth rewatching because they're just. It was just, a time. There was a time, yeah, and and storytelling, especially for kids, took a little longer to do, but you were captivated by the the spaceships and the yeah. and the miniatures and the whole bit. So oh, wow. pick that up. Um, so that was my three: so Johnny Quest, three. Gumby Show, and Thunderbirds. And then, of course, there's always a new release or featured release. And this this week, it's the Bob. It's Bob Hope: The Ultimate Movie Collection on DVD. So. When I read that, I thought you kind of get a warm fuzzy about yeah. Bob Hope, but I, I, I guess for me it's more of a warm fuzzy of it was entertainment from another time, and I'm not sure we'll ever see the likes of it again, mm. because he was he did radio, he did movies, he did TV, he did stand up. I mean, he was, he really did, and one there the were a number of people. One of the performers who did most uh, troop visits as well, right. right? Didn't he do a lot of the? Um... And so I often wonder it's it's a bygone era, and I just think for the nostalgic part of it, it would be uh, great to have something like that. I've never watched, I, you know, if the movie's on, if I'm on one of the old movie channels and one of his movies comes on, I'll watch it. But um, but I don't I don't I don't search it out like I would a Betty Davis a Betty Davis binger. Look at all the people he worked with. Yeah, who so who do you Lucille have? Ball, W. C. Fields, Dorothy Lamour, George Burns, Gracie Allen, Martha Ray, Betty Grable, Paulette Goddard, Jane Russell, Bing Crosby. I mean, it's. Charo, Zsa Zsa Gabor, <laughs> Katie Lyon. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. But actually, you bring up a great point. That kind of variety, like, Doesn't the variety of actors and actresses which Pee Wee pulled into his Playhouse special or Bob Hope could do or any of these guys, it's very different. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure it will happen anymore. It's All right, so let's recap what we've gone over. Tim recommends The Snow Globe by Erasure. It's Erasure, a music CD. Right. Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse Christmas. Christmas Special on DVD. Johnny Quest, The Gumby Show from the 1950s, this remastered thing, or Thunderbirds. And last but not least, Bob Hope, Bob Hope The Ultimate Movie Collection. Visit deepdiscount.com through our website. Click on the shark, the pirate, and Garrett. Thanks, Deep Discount. <laughs> All right, guys, we are going to take a very quick break. And we come back, it's time for the random sample where Tim and I look at LGBT headlines from around the country and perhaps the globe. So stay with us. Globe. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. It's one of John's favorite movies, Faster Pussycat, Kill, Kill. Kill. I'm not so sure Rick from El Paso is going to get any of our picks this week, though. I didn't. Maybe Bob Hope and stuff. I don't know. Rick? Yeah. I think he... Uh, look, every, I just said to Tim during the break that I have a list that I've got to now go on Deep Discount and hack out. And it's, it's, it's the Ella Fitzgerald Oro. Oh, I can't believe you don't have you Ella did Fitzgerald. did Erasure Disc. Yeah. We have Pee Wee's uh, you? Playhouse Christmas We've got it special. in video. I need to... VHS. <laughs> you have it on VHS. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here with John Nash. And uh, we're guestless today, but uh, that means we get to spend some uh, more time with you and go through a segment we call The Random Sample. And uh, where John and I kind of, uh, what do we do? We call, we, we kind of... Curate. Curate. I was going to say culminate. That's the wrong no, word. cultivate. What's culminate? That's end. Culminate means that, yeah, something has a culmination. But John, you know, John you know. took night classes. <laughs> So this anyway, we go into ninth school. We cure, curate LGBT specific content or uh, or tone, and then uh, get to share it with you from across the country. So um, the first one I picked, you would also pick this as well. You, uh oh, it was, it was the no. I mean, you had picked it, and we had talked about it, and then you changed. Oh, okay. But uh, often, John and I will, when you go through some of these regional LGBT papers or media, They're sometimes the same stories are yeah. right. Aggregating. That's the word. You just knew it was there. You knew it was there. Right. Yeah. So the one that I picked, the, the one of the headlines that um, stuck out to me. So the the human rights campaign has something they call the Corporate Equality Index, and uh, a couple of days ago they just released their 2018 uh, companies that scored 100. So that's a perfect score for LGBT equality and uh, for work that they do and how they treat their LGBT employees. The actual. Um, languages. The Corporate Equality Index rates companies based on lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer workplace policies, benefits, internal education, and public commitment to LGBTQ equality. 
So I, I was reading the I was reading the um, the survey and the results, and then I this headline popped up and it said human rights campaign suspends Walmart for their score of 100. So Walmart had earned a 100, a perfect score. And then uh, it now has for this uh, 2018 survey an asterisk by its name because the uh, Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund has brought two, uh, two proceedings to the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission against the company. So until they address some of these issues with their trans employees, they have an asterisk next to it that they've suspended their 100 rating. So it said one concern voiced by the um, TLDEF, that's, you got to change your acronym, guys, um, and others is that good corporate policy must be matched by a commitment to enforcement. And so there's one thing to get the score, but then it needs to be enforced. What are you laughing at? The picture you put up. It's hard to Walmart. find a good Walmart picture. So Ten there's bucks. A woman, says she's there's asked. a woman straddling another woman in a wheelchair, <laughs> and it says ten bucks. Says she's asking where the air fresheners are. I. Is that the Walmart? And I love the look on the woman who's 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 behind the counter, like very you know, nonplussed. Yeah. yeah, that's Walmart. So, uh, <laughs> do you always love the Walmart picture? I do. There's a whole site similar yeah. to Lurid Digs of, of people like bending that's, down. Yeah, cracks, but that's a sideshow. So, um, so apparently there were two two transgender employees that have um have gone to the eoec and um the eoc yeah the equal they're calling it equal opportunity employment commission and um have said that they they've been um vulnerable to severe and per pervasive harassment and discrimination so the one thing that somebody though countered and said that uh, so walmart has been dinged but they said the HRC hasn't always balanced company actions with actual practice. Over the years, there were never any complaints of discrimination by LGBT employees of ExxonMobil. Correct. For instance. Yeah. They said, but they did, but they would always get a score. Their last one was a minus 25. Yeah. And it wasn't until they, uh, until marriage equality came that there's, that obviously the score had gone up. But they said that there's one thing to give these scores and another thing to actually enforce them, which I agree with. Walmart obviously sent uh, th their communications department said that they were sorry to hear of this. Um, they're very proud of their work on inclusive and non discriminatory policies. And, um, but, you know, I, I was I, I looked at the list. So the the other quick thing that was in this study were the nine auto brands that made it. So the thirty six. Well, BW's got a perfect score for a number of years now, right? Right. So there were nine auto brands that uh, have a one hundred uh, percent score. I'm not sure I agree with all of them, but um, here are the automakers that earned the score. So if your car didn't earn one, um, you might want to wonder why. But it's uh, Fiat, Chrysler. Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Hyundai, which is new to the list, Nissan, Mitsubishi, Subaru of America, Tesla, Toyota, and Volkswagen Group of America, which is in, which includes Audi and Bentley. Tesla and, hasn't been around that long. I mean, well, but they obviously have good. So they they took the time. Yeah, to they do took the, the time to do it. Stuff, yeah. But I so I scratched my head and said, well, where's BMW? Where's Mercedes? Where's Jaguar? Where's Land Rover? Where's Mini? Where's Honda? Where's Mazda? I mean, there's a number of companies that aren't. Uh, aren't on this list. And uh, Honda did get an 85, but I think they got dinged on their transgender um, benefits. But I, I, the scores, I think it's always interesting to look at. They list just about every um, company, Fortune 500 company. And they said uh, 600 and some this year earned a perfect score of all the companies they talked to. Bad. Which is good. So you can go to the hrc.org site, and they, they, the list is free to look at. You actually download a yeah. whole PDF on how they do it. And they do and it by category, yeah, so if you wanted down. auto brands, airlines, Package goods, you know, financial yeah. institutions, banks, da 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 So that was my first one. My, uh, my first one was about the retirement of soccer star Robbie Rogers. So LA Galaxy defender Robbie Rogers announced his retirement from professional soccer November 7th through his Instagram and the team's website. I guess that's how it's done. Handsome guy. Rogers came out as gay in 2013, making... Is that the, the same picture of him? Same guy. One's for Out Magazine on the left and one he's in his uh, soccer outfit for a game. Uh, the other one, he's not in his soccer. <laughs> so he came out as gay in 2013, making him the first openly gay male athlete in a major U.S. sport. And he said, my happiest years as a player are the ones where I could walk through the stadium at the end of games, down the tunnel to my partner and son waiting for me at the other end. He added that he only wishes he would have come out earlier. I wish I could have found the courage that so many young individuals have shared with me in the past five years to live honestly and openly as a gay person, he continued. 
And he said, none of this would have been possible without my teammates and brothers on, on and off the field, without the LA Galaxy and Bruce Arena, who saw me as another player and not a distraction, or without the fans who judged me for my work ethic and my play and not my sexuality. And then I think this is his, the LA Galaxy president said, Robbie Rogers has been an integral part of our club and our community since he joined the Galaxy in 2013. So I'm not sure what he's Does doing. How old he is? No, and that's what I, I did a little research and I was wondering if he had, well, I'm going to say early because yeah. he's been playing for a while. Um, is he an American too? Or was he a Brit, I wonder? I always thought that he was actually uh, British, but then moved here and, and took up his life here and became a U.S. citizen or anything. Like so, Beckham. Yeah. But I do remember when he came out. I mean, it's four or five years, four years ago now, and it was a big thing. And soccer is an interesting sport for Americans. I, I, um, if you had to put it in the category of like a football or a baseball, I think soccer comes into the zone of where else would you rank that? Like, is that the cross? <laughs> no, I mean a lot of the, the weird thing about soccer it's in a our great country, game. It's yeah, a, but the and, and it's the number one game around the world, yeah, but yeah. not here. No. And the, but the weird thing is, if you go to any grade school, elementary school, kids are playing. Junior school, high school, all have soccer teams. Lots of kids playing. Lots of leagues. Mm -hmm. When they get to college, college and universities obviously still have soccer teams, but that's kind of where it ends. You know, you don't it is see. It's interesting. The, the, you're you're talking about like go, a theater system. Yeah. yeah. But we have, you know, there's a soccer stadium in Philadelphia, and uh, it's called the, the the team's called the Philadelphia Union, but. It doesn't get talked about as much as football, baseball, and, and as, a, as you said, a totally American phenomena. Because if you're overseas, you you Real Madrid or whatever your team is, you are like oh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Riots of people, in the yeah. stands or something, you know. Was Cristiano Ronaldo? The, uh, is he Real Real Madrid or something? He's that super sexy guy. That is that how you pay attention to these things? Soccer players have great physiques. Why? Because they run a lot. They're up and down, up and up and down the field. I mean, they these guys, they're they're in great shape. They're in great shape. You watch soccer games? No. I just look at the player. <laughs> I'm not gonna watch the game. But I'm watching football this weekend, John. Nope. <laughs> no. Uh, unless you mean football, as in in Europe, soccer is football, watching right? American football this weekend. <laughs> no. no, I'm not. All right. My number two is a short one here. This is right here in your town, John, New York City. I got this out of the. Uh, the Huffington Post, Queer Voices. It says, New York City transport replaces ladies and gentlemen with gender neutral announcements. Have you heard this yet? On trains, you mean like ding, ding, the next stop. Uh, okay, go. So New York City's Metropolitan Transportation Authority is retiring the use of ladies and gentlemen in favor of gender neutral terminology. So there's no more ladies and gentlemen next stop or. So what do they say? Well, according to a local news outlet right here, PIX11. Yeah, w, w, yeah, yeah, WPIX 11 channel, yeah. Subway conductors and bus drivers will now have to address all commuters as passengers, riders, or everyone. Oh, okay. No, I heard that this morning, actually. Passengers, please be advised due to a train incident in Brooklyn. You know, we're da -da -da. so that's the reason why I changed from ladies and gentlemen, you know. All pre-recorded messages will be updated to comply with the new rule the new policy. They said, we're fundamentally changing the way we talk to our riders to give them a better and clearer information, to give them better and clearer information. That's not anything to do with better or clearer information. Not at all. They're same just, ladies, yeah. same passengers versus yeah. ladies. And, and by gentlemen. the way, it's still the same system and it's still yeah. the same delays. <laughs> they said, some people are very unhappy with this change and said it's overly politically correct. They don't like it. Who would they poll? They said some people. Who are these some people? Like, I can't some imagine people are you, unhappy. Would, you would they care. Think it's politically, incor politically correct. I don't have any problem with someone saying, passengers, please be advised. I'm a passenger. I'm also a gentleman. But I... Gentlemen passengers. <laughs> please be advised. Ladies and gentlemen passengers. They said in July, London made the same move and eliminated gender greetings from the tube announcements. They said they wanted everyone to feel welcome on the transport network. So, and exactly what you said, now that they've got gender neutral te uh, terminology covered, maybe they can tackle the delays. Yeah. <laughs> but I, least... I looked at this as similar as if you would say, I guess, flight attendants instead of steward or stewardess, or letter carrier instead of 
postman or well, think firefighter about, instead of think fireman. about the cap flying on a plane. Captain comes on, ladies and gentlemen. Used to be, we're uh, thank you for joining us today. Now it's going to be flyers <laughs> or, or passengers. We're going to be le departing the gate. It's just a it's just a tweak to how we say things. Well, what's the and, point? Yeah, well, I'm I, not a lady. Look, I could see I'm not a gentleman. I wasn't aware that it was offensive. A eh? Now, see, this is the thing that gets me. So, did someone, uh, did enough complaints, c complaints come into the MTA that they actually sat down and said, we better address this issue. We want our conductors to start. I'm sure it did. Because this was the same discussion you and I had two years ago about Facebook allowing people to pick one of 70, see, 70 genders, genders yeah. or something. And, which I understand people are fluid in their, in their, um, in how they d define themselves. But I'm still a male, and I would still call myself a male, but I'm supposed to now say I'm cisgendered, cisgendered yeah. which I would not do. <laughs> which I will not do. No, but I'm, because if you go, if you start to fill out, you're not going to be able to go fill out an application. The, the question for... To get your license and have 70 things. Yeah, it's oh, going to wow. fill in the circle that most... Yeah, yeah. Passengers, flyers, listeners. Flyers. Listeners. That's what we're going to say, listeners. Listeners. So that's my number two. My number two takes us out to Palm Springs. Oh, the Springs. And it goes back to a case in 2009, and the headline is, The judge in the infamous Palm Springs gay cruising sting case made anti-gay comments. So, 2009, a public gay sex sting operation in Palm Springs resulted in 24 arrests and 14 prosecutions. Defense attorneys in the case presented evidence that their clients were targeted because they were gay, but the judge rejected their argument. Now, a secret recording of the judge making a homophobic comment in an unrelated case might shine some light on why he ruled against the gay men. The Warm Sands neighborhood. Now, if you've been out to the Springs, Palm Springs, the, this is the uh, Avenue, Avenue Caballeros, whatever, the Warm Sands area. Warm hands. <laughs> All, a lot of the gay guest houses are literally clustered, and, you know, there's a lot of activity there, and we'll just leave it at that. And people kind of knew that. So it says the Warm Sands neighborhood in Palm Springs was a known cruising area with several gay resorts. In June 2009, Palm Springs police performed a four-night undercover sting in the area and arrested 24 men, all gay. So undercover, quote, capture the fag, close quote, sting operations were more common 10 years ago than they are today. Police usually had flimsy evidence in these cases and expected those arrested to confess, sign a deal, and hope the whole thing would go away without contacting an attorney. So I'm supposing this was some kind of behavioral modification game they were doing. So you get caught propositioning an undercover cop. It, right. you, know, and you know, if you sign this, you're not going to be on the sex offender list, whatever. The gay men in this case, though, fought the charges, leading to an 11-day hearing in 2011 where several defense attorneys presented evidence of police misconduct, asking the judge to dismiss the charges, um, which they did not. Prosecutors and police had a deal in which the officers would encourage the men to engage in acts that would put them on the sex offender registry. Instead of arresting a gay man when he broke the law, the undercover officer would try to get him to, to, go, to go further, like to get, so that if he did something... If he solicited the officer, that was one thing. If the officer said, yeah, yeah, well, how about this? They would try to get him to do something that would put him on the so list. Was that entrapment? It's, and that's what the attorneys were arguing, yeah. So uh, in the previous 10 years in Palm Springs, no one ever had been arrested for such a thing, especially straight people who would get caught having sex in public. Um, and a recording in a police vehicle was released when an officer can be heard during this trial process. He called the men, beep, suckers. <laughs> The police chief was also recorded calling them a bunch of filthy mother beep. <laughs> was this Alabama or was this? This is Palm Springs, Palm Springs. right? Palm Springs. At the end of the hearing, though, uh, Judge David Downing upheld the charges and allowed the prosecution. To, these men were not arrested for being gay. They, they were arrested for having sex in public. Oh. So in 2012, an unrelated murder case, uh, the defendant was secretly recording the uh, the vocal the um, audio feed in the courtroom, during which the judge made um, anti-gay and HIV phobic comments. During a break from jury selection, when the court microphones were turned off, one of the defendants left his laptop on. The judge can be heard in saying that he will not read motions filed by the one by one of the defendants who was gay and HIV positive because they were in envelopes that were presumably licked shut. And the guy says, Lord knows where his, where his tongue has been. When, the, uh, when later confronted, I have, the judge says, I can say what I want. The First Amendment protects me. Of course, the First Amendment does not protect anyone from consequences of their words, and presumably a judge would know that. 
So the, repu- the recording was made public. Um, the attorneys that defended the gay men now understand why they all were convicted because the judge is a homophobe. It had nothing to do with having sex in public. It was this guy just didn't like gay men. The uh, operation was suspended in 2010, and Palm Springs has instead decided that better lit streets and patrol cars are a much better way of (laughs) patrolling things and keeping things safe and quiet. The police chief also resigned as a result of this. So this is all happening in Little Palm Springs. You're not surprised, right? Well, yeah, no, I'm not surprised. and I, I don't know why people are out looking on the streets. You don't have to do it anymore. Um... Yeah, well, now you you raise a good point. So you go back to 2009, though, right? So was that when this was? This was when the arrests happened. So we're talking, you know, yeah, before eight a years lot of ago. the maps and things came about. And also, you're in the Warm Sands area. It's a known cruising spot. You know, it's like the Dick Dock or the, in the P Town or the Meat Rack. And you the, remember when we were there after one of your the, the was it Desert? It's no longer there. The Desert Palm. Yeah. I go to play, I go Elsa, but I lay my head on the I pillow that does the does the palm at night. Tim and I had an hilarious guest house experience in Palm Springs. There's only six rooms, right? It's six or seven rooms. It was great. It was a very uh, mid-century modern type place, and the hilarity came from the guests who would yeah. sit around and tell these stories. And that particular weekend, boy, do we get the it stories. Was, it was great. It was a great group of guys. But at night, you know, guys are going to do what they're going to do. And they went from guest house to guest house. Or And one guy we used to know for years, Barry, who used to stay at the place that we did, used to call it street treats. Street oh, really? treat. A street stand treat. by the window. His He had a room that had a window that looked out on the, on the street. And he would stand there in the dark with a cup of coffee, watching the traffic, the foot traffic go ah, by. Yeah, yeah. It's a street treat. Got Sanka. It's a street treat. Come on in. <laughs> so that was my second one. Well, mine is actually almost similar, which is kind of funny. And John and I don't plan this. This this is kind of almost like a caught my eye too. Though this came out of the this came out of the Philadelphia magazine. So it's not an LGBT pub, but the headline says, "The Curious Case of Rittenhouse." Written houses, no gay cruising sign. So there's a part, any of you familiar with the city of Philadelphia? House Square, right? House Square. So, and for those of you who don't know, Philadelphia is the second largest city on the East Coast. And it's only 80 miles south of New York. People, well, Boston overshadows it, or DC, or Baltimore, or Atlanta, or Charlotte, whatever. But Philly is a big city. And if not for New York, it would be the largest city on the East Coast. So it's a big place. And uh, I'm just giving my, my little. Because so, I shit canned the place a couple weeks ago. Yeah, but now about the thugs at the unions at the at the convention that's different. center. That is totally different. <laughs> but <laughs> so, now, now you redeem it. So this area in Rittenhouse Square, for anybody, I don't know what would your equivalent be in New York, the Upper East Side. So this is where the most posh houses are, multi-million dollar mansions, great location, great parks nearby, just a great part of the city. And for years, it was a cruising place for uh, gay men. And so I was reading this and I just laughed. It said, decades ago, men used to cruise the 2,000 blocks of Delancey, Pine, and Spruce Streets looking for other men. The traffic sign with which the city tried to stop them is still there. So they put this sign up 40 years ago. It said, in the 80s, I was in my first apartment. This is what the writer says. At 20th and Spruce, I remember lying awake as the same bad muffler circled the block all night. It was the sound of desire. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was written well. <laughs> he said, I knew that nighttime was prime for a long standing ritual there. Men cruised the 2000 block of Delancey and Spruce. They would go around looking for other men on the circuit known locally as the merry go round. <laughs> Some men perched on you, stoops. You totally love this for what the author did. Yeah. yeah. Some men w- perched on stoops. Others walked or drove by. The merry when a man round. would pass another and there was interest, he'd pause, he'd turn. If the man looked back, it was if the man looked back, it was game on. At a time was when homosexuality was taboo and yes, illegal. The merry-go-round was non-committal. They said that uh, if you walked into a gay bar at that time, it was tantamount to coming out. So they said particularly a lot of straight men or closeted men would do this loop at the merry-go-round because they were afraid of getting arrested and thrown in on sodomy charges, which is what the city used to do. You're laughing at The merry-go-round and the muffler, the sound of desire. But on the merry-go-round, you could just go (laughs) walking in and you cruise with your eyes. It was a place to test the waters for married men with secret desires. And that's why the sign went up. Our friend with the sputtering muffler was technically breaking the law thanks to the sign that made it illegal to make a left turn on Delancey. (laughs) 
from midnight to 5 a.m. You could do it any other time. The sign is still there. It's hilarious. I've seen it. Next time you come to Philly, you and I are going to go get our picture taken. Midnight to 5. No, They've asked that's... the city about it. They keep putting it up. No one knows why it's still there. The neighbors don't quite understand why it's there. It was put up over 40 years ago for this particular reason. The headline in the newspaper said that it was a result of a petition so that the tra to reduce traffic and noise and they said that um, they talked to someone at the streets department who didn't even really know the sign was there. And um, so it's been there forever. And they were thinking of taking it down. But they said that maybe they'll just leave it to let people know that um, we maybe not have come as far or were as enlightened as we used to be. So the, the other thing that um, they did say about it was that um, <laughs> they, they, I won't even read that line, but they essentially said that um, neighbors aren't losing sleep anymore. The fear of AIDS slowed the merry-go-round down, as did Grinder and Tinder, which has stopped it all together. And that was my thing about the spring. It slowed the merry-go-round down, or stuff. No one gets the brass ring. Said either. the real life serendipity is gone. Real? It, 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 what if? In, in real life, serendipity is gone. And they said that uh, the merry-go-round uh, no longer needs to, needs to exist. And so the traffic um, doesn't need to be diverted as it used to be. Now, my friend, I, the other reason this caught me, one of my dear friends who did pass away, um, Chris Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. When he first moved to Philly, he was from South Carolina. I had no idea what this merry-go-round was. And he had this old Volkswagen jet, and he's like, come on, Timmy, we're going for a ride. And this would be after the <laughs> bars would close. And I jumped. Come on, Timmy, we're going for a ride. Jet, and I never understood what we were doing. I said, oh, these are really nice houses. Like, I never understood what Why we were doing. Why you were doing, doing the merry-go-round. He knew enough to go two or three blocks down further, make a bigger loop so that you wouldn't go through the residential part. But then we would laugh. And then the cops would kind of, you know, they would all be crisscrossing as well. And as long as you just kept moving and moving around. But we would laugh. We ran into somebody we knew. <laughs> it's about 2 in the morning. And he was walking up around the merry-go-round. And Chris, of course, pulls up. Beep, beep. I bruise. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I'm going to return videos. He had, like, this little bag of video. We're like, mm-hmm. He's like, there's no video stores open up here. And a drop box. And he just wanted to it'd be like you. Just wanted to let him know I saw you. You've been marked. You've been marked, right. So that was my third. Oh, my God. All right. Uh, we'll wrap up random sample with my last one. It comes to us courtesy of Starbucks. It's a quick one. Same-sex couple gets cozy in Starbucks' new holiday commercial. You so got to see a commercial. Is it a TV spot? There's a TV spot, and it's uh, the coffee giant hit the ground running with its annual Yuletide campaign. In a nod to the adult coloring book craze, this year's cups, the cups themselves, feature hints of red and green but are mostly black and white line drawings, encouraging customers to fill in the stylized trees, ornaments, and gifts with the hues of their choice. That's because the evangelicals got all wound up. Now we have to have cups. Now we have to, yeah, exactly. I remember that. That's last year was the color of the cup. Yeah, I didn't yeah. say Merry Christmas. Christmas. I'm crazy. However, it's the commercial for this year's holiday campaign titled Give Good that generated the most buzz. The animated clip, which also debuted November 1st and can be viewed above or here on our screen, features a bevy of diverse families strolling through winter landscapes. Among them are two women who cozy up to one another with a steaming cup of coffee as fireworks burst in the background. So we're going to watch it. Oh, isn't that pretty? A lot of red. How much of this, how long did this take to make, John, this animation? A good amount of time. Really? Yeah. It's got to be really carefully planned. And that's the moment. Are those lesbians? They say they are, yeah. Uh, for a kiss. Starbucks spokeswoman told HuffPost that the aim of the Give Good campaign is simply to showcase the connections shared by our customers with their family and friends at this time of year. We will continue to embrace and welcome customers from all backgrounds and religions in our stores around the world. And this goes all the way back to your Jim Beam thing. Yeah. Because this is a different kind. someone who would get upset at that is not going to Starbucks. No. Right? There's and, a certain... And like the best advertising you and I have ever seen or done, the consumer connects that yeah. circle. Like, so they just show two women, their hands touching over a cup of coffee. You figure it out. Yeah. And if you're, if you're a lesbian, you're, oh, how, it's a beautiful, cute couple. If you're millennial, oh, two friends. You know, you, who knows how you... Something but... stuck in her teeth. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so Starbucks has actually been a pretty big um, supporter of the community, actually. So I, I thought that was kind of a fun little, fun little Where'd thing. Where'd you find that? That was on HuffPost. Really? Yeah. I didn't see that one. I usually, I would, usually yeah, that would Usually on the HuffPost yeah. one, yeah. Huh. All right, folks, that was the random sample. News items from around the U.S. and the globe.
and perhaps the globe. We're going to take a really super quick break. When we come back, uh, Tim found a fun shop talk for us, and its title is The Eight-Hour Workday Has No Place in Modern Society. Here's why. So stay with us. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Now back to the focus group with Tim and John. Because he has a lot of chutzpah. An entertaining look at the world of business. Heads are spinning, heads are spinning. Listen, laugh, and learn. I am not gay. I never have been gay. That's my vice. Remember when that's all we had to worry about was Larry Craig, Larry Craig in Colorado. Roy Moore and all these Is that his name? Because <laughs> pistols, Roy Moore. I'm still laughing about the car with the sound of desire with the broken muffler and that we were trying to imagine, as John and I do. <laughs> who was driving was that? that what car? kind of who's car was it? Who was driving? No wonder why he was there all night. Sound of desire. I like a well-written piece. The one that makes me laugh. I yeah. truly do. So, uh... Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Hello, everybody. I guess boys and girls you can't do anymore either. No, that's going to be problematic. That's going to definitely be problematic at some point down Hello, the line. Hello, everybody. So uh, our shop talk today, as John mentioned before a quick break, is that the eight-hour workday has no place in modern society. Here's why. This was written by um, by somebody in a in a, a blog that John and I often go to called Low Ladders. And uh, and they have lots of good articles. And this one, I can't even remember. I can't even pronounce the person's name, so I'm not going to. Chiara, Chiara Messiona. Messiona wrote, wrote this one. But the gist of it, and I took, I, I reminded myself of Paul Hagen. If you're looking, if you could see my John, I took entirely way too many notes. I don't oh my know God. why. I this spilled is what notes. You, now to compare, I underlined a couple things, but <laughs> I took an awful lot of notes about it. But the gist of it, and this is something you've said all the time, is that. We've become much more of a society of knowledge. Yeah, knowledge-based. And knowledge-based versus assembly line manufacturing, which is we still have and which is still an important part of our workplace and our economy. But they said this notion as we've changed with technology and people can work at home or you can telecommute, the, eight, the, the misnomer of the eight-hour day where you're just putting in hours versus putting in quality time and getting the job done that did not change. So we still have this eight hour day focus in our heads, but technology has allowed us to either time shift or do things differently and it hasn't caught up. And so that was my takeaway from it. You've said this a million times that you think more when you're either out on your bike. Well, she even said it in her article. Not so alone. The eight hour work shift is a definite, definite carryover from the industrial revolution. Yep. And it was also a total byproduct of the fact that people used to be totally overworked in these factories and jobs and the eight hour standard was the idea that you would sequester the work to eight hours you could then measure it productivity wise and evaluate people's performances within that time span but again we were talking about physical physically demanding jobs and so what Tim was just alluding to though is at one point she says for jobs that require a massive amount of creativity, curiosity and flexibility, the 8-hour work shift is irrelevant and at times constraining. So if any of you are in industries where you have to come up with ideas or marketing plans or whatever they may be, sometimes if you're sitting at your desk, you're not the idea is not going to pop into your head just because you're at your desk. Yes. It's going to come to you when you've sufficiently researched it or you've done the reading. Um, I was fascinated by this because later in the article, um, they, did you did you highlight the thing about uh, Warren Buffett? Yes, which I okay. thought was interesting. Warren Buffett's business partner, Charlie Munger. Yeah, you, you could read that if you... He said in an interview with CNBC, in my whole life, I've known no wise people who didn't read all the time. None, zero. He says, as knowledge workers, we need to spend time thinking and feeding our curiosity through activities like reading. And uh, I thought that was interesting. He said Warren Buffett reads probably half the day, right? And he says Munger uh, also has also has also been known to say about his partner, I would say half of all the time Buffett spends is sitting on his ass reading. Yeah. <laughs> he has a lot of time to think. That's you. And uh, except you don't have that money. <laughs> except I don't have the Warren Buffett money. And you're not making you're not making money reading sci-fi. You got to read something. Got to read. Make some coin. But as Tim said, you know, when uh, I jokingly gave a present, I didn't jokingly give a presentation, but I gave a presentation recently. Um, I think uh, we were talking about advertising, and someone after the presentation asked me about some of the campaigns that we used to do for Subaru and Diet Pepsi and Absolute, and 
and he said, you know, how did those all come about? And I said, well, I'll tell you one thing. None of my best ideas ever came at the office. Zero. None ever came at the office. They came on a bike ride. They came on the train or on the weekend. Something would click. Now, I used to spend all my time, um, actually, the, and I think you were the same, too. Nine to five was a lot of talking, a lot of phone calls, a lot of conference calls. And that's a, that's a hard thing to stop that and then say, okay, now i got to be I mean, creative. I was just talking to the CMO of a Fortune 2 company <laughs> this weekend, and he had said to me, so he's the CMO, which is a huge job, billions of dollars, Chief right? marketing officer. Chief yeah. marketing officer. He said, I do no marketing anymore. No. He said, I just sit in meetings, and I, all my creativity is gone. But to what you said at a certain degree, the best ideas come when he might be in a plane somewhere or mm -hmm. somewhere different. But it's that whole being slavish to the to the uh, to the office or to the cubicle. I had worked at a place where it was five thirty. Nobody could leave until five thirty. You could be done at one. I remember this job. And you, I would go crazy. This drove you crazy. You were done with your work by eleven. Would, yeah, well, there's nothing to do. So I, I was there, and it would drive me crazy. I even got in trouble for going out. They didn't want you to go out for lunch either. Eat communal. Yeah, to eat communally, yeah. which drove me crazy. You couldn't go get a cup of coffee or a drink. So they supplied. They had a great refrigerator full of stuff, but they didn't want you leaving because they wanted you there working. And I used to talk about how uh, how unproductive it was. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing I will say when I managed employees was that I always treated them like adults. And if you treat people like adults, they're going to act like adults. Get their, yeah. They'll get their work done and do it when it needs to be done and be responsible and end up probably working longer and better. or harder and get and better. a better. Beth Gardner was the best example of that of an employee. You used to say to people, to I remember once I was in your office when you said to somebody, they were going on a business trip and you said, take the afternoon off, pick up your dry cleaning, run your errands. When you get back, you'll tackle the job. Well, a lot of these people would travel 50 to 80% of the time. Most of it was weekends. Yep. I knew that they had, in some cases, partners or husband or spouse, wife, really? yep. kids. You're going to miss a kid's soccer game. You're going to miss a kid's band practice, whatever. You can't buy that time back. So I would say, listen, I know you're going to be traveling this weekend. If Wednesday you need to leave at noon to go watch your daughter play soccer or something, just don't announce it. We had a Do very it. quiet rule of yeah. you get your work done. If I know where you are and I need you, I can find you. But you control your schedule. You control your budget. And it, I never had a problem with anybody. And, and I had a problem one time with somebody. But, the, the, but generally, you're not going to have problems if you treat people you like never, adults. You never once mentioned that policy as being problematic. And in fact, you used to always say how... Uh, oh, HR how, was fear, would be but, furious but with your me. staff was they very know. appreciative yeah. of the fact that they had a little flexibility. Um, and I would say to people that work freelancers or people in the creative industry, this notion that you wake up at 8, you're on the clock at 9, you're done at 5, it just doesn't, and it causes a lot of interesting consternation, great word I, I like using, because you start judging yourself by what you've accomplished in an 8-hour window, when in fact you might do your best work from 6 to 9 at night. or 5 a.m. in the morning. 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. Um, I do my best creative stuff usually in the late afternoon early evening i don't know why <laughs> no, you can't i think we're and and i think the writer in here was smart by saying that it's not talking about abolishing the no. eight hour day because no. there's retail stores that obviously are there's open a, it's and a structure a, and there's a structure and that stores need to be open 16 hours so you have shifts or there are still manufacturing places or or uh, assembly lines or other sorts of jobs where it is important to yep to uh, be there it could be healthcare. you know that 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 stuff's important but from a small business standpoint or a creative standpoint um there is a misnomer i think about the eight hours i was thinking about you and i people often joke that you and i just kind of do this and then go away and it's <laughs> which is always the biggest laugh of the century it's like but I, I i clocked how much time after i read this i clocked how much time i spent yesterday and how much time i spent monday and it was not balanced but at the end of the day, I was also up until 11 one night. I started working the next day at 5. I had to do something in the midday. But, yeah. you know, it, I knew in my mind I could plan it. And they said, that's the important part. If you know what you have to do, you'll do it. But there's no reason why you can't time shift your... your uh, I'll wrap day. this one up, taking it all the way back to animation again. But when we, I was doing the program, one of the things the instructors talked about, I was bad about this. And many students are because they just want to get animating right away, but they forced us to spend the time to prep and plan and be creative and think about what you're doing because there's no point 
in sitting down to do something like a big project unless you have a road map, right? It just doesn't happen along the way, and that's the same with advertising and marketing. Know where you're going. What's your A to B? And sometimes that planning, while frustrating, or you want to get going, maybe it's not in the eight-hour workday, whatever, that's the foundation of success. And if you give that the right amount of time, everything else works fine. However. Yeah, however, okay. You and I, even though we've got a yin and yang, the one thing you and I have in common, along with our friend Marianne, which we had in high school, and, her, yes. and the parents talked about it, we could procrastinate. Yeah, we were terrible. Mrs. Candido would say, you guys could talk all day about what you're going to do and get nothing done. <laughs> and That's the mother, mother of one of our best friends. We I've loved never her. Seen any people to, I've never seen, I've people, seen three talk, people talk so much. Talk so much about what they're going to do and get nothing, nothing done. done. <laughs> and you and I, unfortunately, can feed off that. Oh, Jan, we're going to do that. We're writing a book. <laughs> it's been three years. We're got, we'll get it out. But somebody needs to give us a deadline. And when we get a deadline, but yeah. I was like that in high school and I was like that in college. Were you the same way? Yeah. You could have a term paper that you had all semester to write. And when was it written? Two days before Two days it was before. due. Oh, you might have thought a, about it. I had an advisor in, in uh, college tell me that uh, I was one of the lucky ones. And he said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're a procrastinator. He goes, but you know how to procrastinate. And I said, what does that mean? He goes, you're, you're smart enough to get it done correctly, and you know that there's that make or break moment when you got to do it. He said, other students aren't so lucky. No. <laughs> they procrastinate, and then they're kind of, you know. Well, I tried to do better, and you and I both had. I think you were in my class with Emo Elgis our senior year. No, that was you. So that was me, and I had to. This was at Pompa Rock High School. John and I went to high school together in Southbury, Middlebury, Connecticut. And I had to write a story about the annex, why Quebec wanted to leave Canada, so the um, seceding from Canada. So they were going to become their own always. country. Always. They're always complaining. They want so to the secede. Quebec's going to leave and they're going to break up the country. Canada, we had to write about why that would not be a good thing or why it could be a good, it could be a good thing. So my grandmother, my relatives were Canadian, so I thought, well, I'll just ask my grandmother. Why do research? <laughs> my grandmother was a staunch, born in England, so a staunch... Anglophile wanted nothing to do with the French, and so I wrote this whole paper from my grandmother's point, point of view, view. With no bibliography, nothing. And I remember the email just handing out oh, this papers. is my favorite story. He's handing out all the papers, handing out all the papers. I'm like, where is mine? And all of a sudden, he comes with a baggie from behind. Oh, with a baggie in the a lunch, one of those lunch, Ziploc the, lunch. Right. The 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 paper was folded up in like three inches by three inch square, and this baggie. And I have the whole class is looking, and he comes and he drops it. Pew. And I said, what's that? He goes, your paper. And I said, well, wh why is that? He said, it shouldn't be handled. <laughs> <laughs> he was a real. Meaning it was, you know. Shouldn't be handled. Right, you know what that means, what's in a bag. He said, so, right, write it again. And uh, then he did laugh about it. He's like, where'd you get all I said, my grandmother's Canadian. And that's the other thing. We used to be able to talk our way out of anything. Yeah. Man, did we talk away. We And this. By the way, my mom, who taught in the region, they'd laugh about our excuses in the teacher's lounge. Did you hear what Nash and Bennett came up with this week? <laughs> anyway, folks, thanks for joining us today. Um, it's the Focus Group. Go to focusgroupradio.com to find out all about the show or our Facebook page, Focus Group Radio, as well. We want to thank our partners, Deep Discount. What did we go over today? We did... Um, Race Your Snow Globe. Race Your Snow Globe. Kiwi's, Kiwi's Playhouse Christmas, Christmas special. special. Johnny Quest. Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds. Gumby from the 50s. And I want to see that one. The Bob Hope um, collection, uh, collection on, on Blu-ray from Deep Discount. So thank you to them. Visit our site. Click on the shark logo. Arr, and you'll get there. Big thanks to Volkswagen Group of America. Check out the new 2018 Tiguan and, of course, the new, not, not so new, it's been a few months, but the Atlas is still a great-looking car, one that you should put on your list if you're looking for a SUV. I'd say it's a they have one of the best warranties now, the People First People warranty. First warranty. Uh, don't text and drive, arrive alive. And that's just kind of a throw out there. I want more, I want more. <laughs> it's that time of year. Don't text and drive, arrive alive. Okay, better? All right. Better. See you next week, folks. Thank you. <laughs>